The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Read by Sarah Partridge. Originally self published in 1925. This recording is a production of the Master Key Society. Copyright 2021, Master Key Society. Chapter 1 The Game. Most people consider life a battle, but it is not a battle, it is a game. It is a game, however, which cannot be played successfully without the knowledge of spiritual law, and the Old and New Testaments give the rules of the game with wonderful clearness. Jesus Christ taught that it was a great game of giving and receiving. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This means that whatever man sends out in word or deed will return to him. What he gives, he will receive. If he gives hate, he will receive hate. If he gives love, he will receive love. If he gives criticism, he will receive criticism. If he lies, he will be lied to. If he cheats, he will be cheated. We are taught also that the imaging faculty plays a leading part in the game of life. Keep thy heart, or imagination, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 This means that what man images, sooner or later, externalizes in his affairs. I know of a man who feared a certain disease. It was a very rare disease and difficult to get, but he pictured it continually and read about it until it manifested in his body, and he died the victim of distorted imagination. So we see to play successfully the game of life, we must train the imaging faculty. A person with an imaging faculty trained to image only good brings into his life every righteous desire of his heart. Health, wealth, love, friends, perfect self-expression, his highest ideals. The imagination has been called the scissors of the mind. And it is ever cutting, cutting day by day the pictures man sees there. And sooner or later, he meets his own creations in his outer world. To train the imagination successfully, man must understand the workings of his mind. The Greek said, know thyself. There are three departments of the mind, the subconscious, conscious, and superconscious. The subconscious is simply power without direction. It is like steam or electricity, and it does what it is directed to do. It has no power of induction. Whatever man feels deeply or images clearly is impressed upon the subconscious mind and carried out in minutest detail. For example, a woman I know when a child always made believe she was a widow. She dressed up in black clothes and wore a long black veil, and people thought she was very clever and amusing. She grew up and married a man with whom she was deeply in love. In a short time, he died, and she wore black and a sweeping veil for many years. The picture of herself as a widow was impressed upon the subconscious mind, and in due time worked itself out, regardless of the habit created. The conscious mind has been called mortal or carnal mind. It is the human mind and sees life as it appears to be. It sees death disaster, sickness, poverty, and limitation of every kind, and it impresses the subconscious. The superconscious mind is the God mind within each man, and is the realm of perfect ideas. In it is the perfect pattern spoken of by Plato, the divine design, for there is a divine design for each person. There is a place that you are to fill and no one else can fill, something you are to do which no one else can do. There is a perfect picture of this in the superconscious mind. It usually flashes across the conscious as an unattainable idea, something too good to be true. In reality, it is man's true destiny or destination flashed to him from the infinite intelligence which is within himself. Many people, however, are in ignorance of their true destinies and are striving for things and situations which do not belong to them and would only bring failure and dissatisfaction if attained. For example, 
A woman came to me and asked me to speak the word that she would marry a certain man with whom she was very much in love. She called him A.B. I replied that this would be a violation of spiritual law, but that I would speak the word for the right man, the divine selection, the man who belonged to her by divine right. I added, if A.B. is the right man, you can't lose him. And if he isn't, you will receive his equivalent. She saw A.B. frequently, but no headway was made in their friendship. One evening, she called and said, Do you know, for the last week, A.B. hasn't seemed so wonderful to me. I replied, Maybe he is not the divine selection. Another man may be the right one. Soon after that, she met another man who fell in love with her at once, and who said she was his ideal. In fact, he said all the things that she had always wished A.B. would say to her. She remarked, it was quite uncanny. She soon returned his love and lost all interest in A.B. This shows the law of substitution. A right idea was substituted for a wrong one. Therefore, there was no loss or sacrifice involved. Jesus Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he said the kingdom was within man. The kingdom is the realm of right ideas, or the divine pattern. Jesus Christ taught that man's words played a leading part in the game of life. By your words ye are justified, and by your words ye are condemned. Many people have brought disaster into their lives through idle words. For example, a woman once asked me why her life was now one of poverty, of limitation. Formerly she had a home was surrounded by beautiful things and had plenty of money. We found she had often tired of the management of her home and had said repeatedly, I'm sick and tired of things. I wish I lived in a trunk. And she added, today I am living in that trunk. She had spoken herself into a trunk. The subconscious mind has no sense of humor and people often joke themselves into unhappy experiences. For example, a woman who had a great deal of money joked continually about getting ready for the poorhouse. In a few years, she was almost destitute, having repressed the subconscious mind with a picture of lack and limitation. Fortunately, the law works both ways, and a situation of lack may be changed to one of plenty. For example, a woman came to me one hot summer's day for a treatment for prosperity. She was worn out, dejected, and discouraged. She said she possessed just $8 in the world. I said, good, we'll bless the $8 and multiply them as Jesus Christ multiplied the loaves and the fishes. For he taught that every man had the power to bless and to multiply, to heal and to prosper. She said, what shall I do next? I replied, follow intuition. Have you a hunch to do anything or to go anywhere? Intuition means intuition, or to be taught from within. It is man's unerring guide, and I will deal more fully with its laws in a following chapter. The woman replies, I don't know. I seem to have a hunch to go home. I've just enough money for car fare. Her home was in a distant city and was one of lack and limitation. And the reasoning mind, or intellect, would have said, stay in New York and get work and make some money. I replied, then go home, never violate a hunch. I spoke the following words for her, infinite spirit, open the way for great abundance. She is an irresistible magnet for all that belongs to her by divine right. I told her to repeat it continually also. She left for home immediately. In calling on a woman one day, she linked up with an old friend of her family. Through this friend, she received thousands of dollars in a most miraculous way. She has said to me often, tell people about the woman who came to you with eight dollars and a hunch. There is always plenty on man's pathway, but it can only be brought into manifestation through desire, faith, or the spoken word. Jesus Christ brought out clearly that man must make the first move. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7:7. 7, 7. In the scriptures we read, Concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Infinite intelligence, God, 
is ever ready to carry out man's smallest or greatest demands. Every desire, uttered or unexpressed, is a demand. We are often startled by having a wish suddenly fulfilled. For example, one Easter, having seen many beautiful rose trees in the florist's windows, I wished I would receive one, and for an instant saw it mentally being carried in the door. Easter came, and with it, a beautiful rose tree. I thanked my friend the following day and told her it was just what I had wanted. She replied, I didn't send you a rose tree, I sent you lilies. The man had mixed the order and sent me a rose tree simply because I had started the law in action, and I had to have a rose tree. Nothing stands between man and his highest ideals and every desire of his heart but doubt and fear. When man can wish without worrying, every desire will be instantly fulfilled. I will explain more fully in a following chapter the scientific reason for this and how fear must be erased from the consciousness. It is man's only enemy, fear of lack, fear of failure, fear of sickness, fear of loss, and a feeling of insecurity on some plane. Jesus Christ said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Matthew 8.26 So we can see we must substitute faith for fear, for fear is only inverted faith. It is faith in evil instead of good. The object of the game of life is to see clearly one's good and to obliterate all mental pictures of evil. This must be done by impressing the subconscious mind with a realization of good. A very brilliant man who has attained great success told me he had suddenly erased all fear from his consciousness by reading a sign which hung in a room. He saw printed in large letters this statement, Why worry? It will probably never happen. These words were stamped indelibly upon his subconscious mind, and he has now a firm conviction that only good can come into his life. Therefore, only good can manifest. In the following chapter, I will deal with the different methods of impressing the subconscious mind. It is man's faithful servant, but one must be careful to give it the right orders. Man has ever a silent listener at his side. His subconscious mind, every thought, Every word is impressed upon it and carried out in amazing detail. It is like a singer making a record on the sensitive disc of the phonographic plate. Every note and tone of the singer's voice is registered. If he coughs or hesitates, it is registered also. So let us break all the old bad records in the subconscious mind, the records of our lives which we do not wish to keep and make new and beautiful ones. Speak these words aloud with power and conviction. I now smash and demolish by my spoken word every untrue record in my subconscious mind. They shall return to the dust heap of their native nothingness, for they came from my own vain imaginings. I now make my perfect records through the Christ within, the records of health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. This is the square of life the game completed. In the following chapters, I will show how man can change his conditions by changing his words. Any man who does not know the power of the word is behind the times. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18.21 Chapter 2, The Law of Prosperity Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. One of the greatest messages given to the race through the scriptures is that God is man's supply, and that man can release through his spoken word all that belongs to him by divine right. He must, however, have perfect faith in his spoken word. Isaiah said, My word shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that whereunto it is sent. We know now that words and thoughts are a tremendous vibratory force, ever molding man's body and affairs. A woman came to me in great distress and said she was to be sued on the 15th of the month for $3,000. She knew no way of getting the money and was in despair. I told her God was her supply and that there is a supply for every demand. So I spoke the word. 
I gave thanks that the woman would receive $3,000 at the right time in the right way. I told her she must have perfect faith and act her perfect faith. The 15th came, but no money had materialized. She called me on the phone and asked what she was to do. I replied, it is Saturday, so they won't sue you today. Your part is to act rich, thereby showing perfect faith that you will receive it by Monday. She asked me to lunch with her to keep up her courage. When I joined her at the restaurant, I said, this is no time to economize. Order an expensive luncheon. Act as if you have already received the $3,000. All things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You must act as if you had already received. The next morning, she called me on the phone and asked me to stay with her during the day. I said, no, you are divinely protected and God is never too late. In the evening, she phoned again, greatly excited and said, my dear, a miracle has happened. I was sitting in my room this morning when the doorbell rang. I said to the maid, don't let anyone in. The maid, however, looked out the window and said, it's your cousin with the long white beard. So I said, call him back. I would like to see him. He was just turning the corner when he heard the maid's voice and he came back. He talked for about an hour and just as he was leaving, he said, oh, by the way, how are finances? I told him I needed the money and he said, why, my dear, I will give you $3,000 the first of the month. I didn't like to tell him I was going to be sued. What shall I do? I won't receive it till the first of the month and I must have it tomorrow. I said, I'll keep on treating. I said, spirit is never too late. I give thanks she has received the money on the invisible plane and that it manifests on time. The next morning, her cousin called her up and said, come to my office this morning and I will give you the money. That afternoon, she had $3,000 to her credit in the bank and wrote checks as rapidly as her excitement would permit. If one asks for success and prepares for failure, he will get the situation he has prepared for. For example, a man came to me asking me to speak the word that a certain debt would be wiped out. I found he spent his time planning what he would say to the man when he did not pay his bill, thereby neutralizing my words. He should have seen himself paying the debt. We have a wonderful illustration of this in the Bible relating to the three kings who were in the desert without water for their men and horses. They consulted the prophet Elisha, who gave them this astonishing message. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet make this valley full of ditches. Man must prepare for the thing he has asked for when there isn't the slightest sign of it in sight. For example, a woman found it necessary to look for an apartment during the year when there was a great shortage of apartments in New York. It was considered almost an impossibility, and her friends were sorry for her and said, isn't it too bad you'll have to store your furniture and live in a hotel? She replied, you needn't feel sorry for me. I'm a Superman, and I'll get an apartment. She spoke the words, infinite spirit opened the way for the right apartment. She knew there was a supply for every demand and that she was unconditioned working on the spiritual plane and that one with God is a majority. She had contemplated buying new blankets when the tempter, the adverse thought or reasoning mind suggested, don't buy the blankets. Perhaps after all, you won't get an apartment and you will have no use for them. She promptly replied to herself, I'll dig my ditches by buying the blankets. So she prepared for the apartment, acted as though she already had it. She found one in a miraculous way, and it was given to her, although there were over 200 other applicants. The blankets showed active faith. It is needless to say that the ditches dug by the three kings in the desert were filled to overflow. Read two kings. Getting into the spiritual swing of things is no easy matter for the average person. The adverse thoughts of doubt and fear surge from the subconscious. They are the army of the aliens, which must be put to flight. This explains why it is so often darkest before the dawn. A big demonstration is usually preceded by tormenting thoughts. Having made a statement of high spiritual truth, 
one challenges the old beliefs in the subconscious, and error is exposed to be put out. This is the time when one must make his affirmations of truth repeatedly and rejoice and give thanks that he has already received. Before ye call, I shall answer. This means that every good and perfect gift is already man's awaiting his recognition. Man can only receive what he sees himself receiving. The children of Israel were told that they could have all the land they could see. This is true of every man. He has only the land within his own mental vision. Every great work, every big accomplishment has been brought into manifestation through holding to the vision. And often just before the big achievement comes apparent failure and discouragement. The children of Israel, when they reached the promised land, were afraid to go in, for they said it was filled with giants who made them feel like grasshoppers. And there we saw the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. This is almost every man's experience. However, the one who knows spiritual law is undisturbed by appearance and rejoices while he is yet in captivity. That is, he holds to his vision and gives thanks that the end is accomplished he has received. Jesus Christ gave a wonderful example of this. He said to his disciples, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are ripe already to harvest. His clear vision pierced the world of matter, and he saw clearly the fourth dimensional world, things as they really are, perfect and complete in divine mind. So man must ever hold the vision of his journey's end and demand the manifestation of that which he has already received. It may be his perfect health, love, supply, self-expression, home, or friends. They are all finished and perfect ideas registered in divine mind, man's own superconscious mind, and must come through him, not to him. For example, a man came to me asking for treatments for success. It was imperative that he raise within a certain time $50,000 for his business. The time limit was almost up, and he came to me in despair. No one wanted to invest in his enterprise, and the bank had flatly refused a loan. I replied, I suppose you lost your temper while at the bank, therefore your power. You can control any situation if you first control yourself. Go back to the bank, I added, and I will treat. My treatment was, you are identified in love with the spirit of everyone connected with the bank. Let the divine idea come out of this situation. He replied, woman, you are talking about an impossibility. Tomorrow is Saturday. The bank closes at 12 and my train won't get me there until 10. And the time limit is up tomorrow and anyway, they won't do it. It's too late. I replied, God doesn't need any time and is never too late. With him, all things are possible. I added, I don't know anything about business, but I know all about God. He replied, it all sounds fine when I sit here listening to you, but when I go out, it's terrible. He lived in a distant city, and I did not hear from him for a week. Then came a letter. It read, You were right. I raised the money and will never again doubt the truth of all that you told me. I saw him a few weeks later, and I said, What happened? You evidently had plenty of time after all. He replied, My train was late and I got there just 15 minutes to 12. I walked into the bank quietly and said, I have come for the loan, and they gave it to me without a question. It was the last 15 minutes of the time allotted to him, and infinite spirit was not too late. In this instance, the man could never have demonstrated a loan. He needed someone to help him hold to the vision. This is what one man can do for another. Jesus Christ knew the truth of this when he said, If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. One gets too close to his own affairs and becomes doubtful and fearful. The friend or healer sees clearly the success, health, or prosperity and never wavers because he is not close to the situation. 
It is much easier to demonstrate for someone else than for oneself, so a person should not hesitate to ask for help if he feels himself wavering. A keen observer of life once said, no man can fail if some one person sees him successful. Such is the power of the vision, and many a great man has owed his success to a wife or sister or a friend who believed in him and held without wavering to the perfect pattern. Chapter 3, The Power of the Word By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. A person knowing the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. He has only to watch the reaction of his words to know that they do not return void. Through his spoken word, man is continually making laws for himself. I know a man who said, I always miss a car. It invariably pulls out just as I arrive. His daughter said, I always catch a car. It's sure to come just as I get there. This occurred for years. Each had made a separate law for himself, one of failure, one of success. This is the psychology of superstitions. The horseshoe, or rabbit's foot, contains no power, but man's spoken word and belief that it will bring him good luck creates expectancy in the subconscious mind and attracts a lucky situation. I find, however, this will not work when man has advanced spiritually and knows a higher law. One cannot turn back and must put away graven images. For example, two men in my class had had great success in business for several months when suddenly everything went to smash. We tried to analyze the situation, and I found instead of making their affirmations and looking to God for success and prosperity, they had each bought a lucky monkey. I said, oh, I see. You have been trusting in the lucky monkey instead of God. Put away the lucky monkeys and call on the law of forgiveness, for man has power to forgive or neutralize his mistakes. They decided to throw the lucky monkeys down a coal hole and all went well again. This does not mean, however, that one should throw away every lucky ornament or horseshoe about the house, but he must recognize that the power back of it is the one and only power, God, and that the object simply gives him a feeling of expectancy. I was with a friend one day who was in deep despair. In crossing the street, she picked up a horseshoe Immediately, she was filled with joy and hope. She said God has sent her the horseshoe in order to keep up her courage. It was indeed at that moment about the only thing that could have registered in her consciousness. Her hope became faith, and she ultimately made a wonderful demonstration. I wish to make the point clear that the men previously mentioned were depending on the monkeys alone, while this woman recognized the power back of the horseshoe. I know in my own case, it took a long while to get out of a belief that a certain thing brought disappointment. If the thing happened, disappointment invariably followed. I found the only way I could make a change in the subconscious was by asserting, there are not two powers. There is only one power, God. Therefore, there are no disappointments. And this thing means a happy surprise. I noticed a change at once happy surprises commenced coming my way. I have a friend who said nothing could induce her to walk under a ladder. I said, if you are afraid, you are giving in to a belief in two powers, good and evil, instead of one. As God is absolute, there can be no opposing power unless man makes the false of evil for himself. To show you believe in only one power, God, and that there is no power or reality in evil, walk under the next ladder you see. Soon after, she went to her bank. She wished to open her box in the safety deposit vault, and there stood a ladder on her pathway. It was impossible to reach the box without passing under the ladder. She quailed with fear and turned back. She could not face the lion on her pathway. However, when she reached the street, my words rang in her ears, and she decided to return and walk under it. It was a big moment in her life, for ladders had held her in bondage for years. 
She retraced her steps to the vault, and the ladder was no longer there. This so often happens. If one is willing to do a thing he is afraid to do, he does not have to. It is the law of non-resistance which is so little understood. Someone has said that courage contains genius and magic. Face a situation fearlessly, and there is no situation to face. It falls away of its own weight. The explanation is that fear attracted the ladder on the woman's pathway, and fearlessness removed it. Thus, the invisible forces are ever working for a man who is always pulling the strings himself, though he does not know it. Owing to the vibratory power of words, whatever man voices, he begins to attract. People who continually speak of disease invariably attract him. After man knows the truth, he cannot be too careful of his words. For example, I have a friend who often says on the phone, do come to see me and have a fine old-fashioned chat. This old-fashioned chat means an hour of about 500 to 1,000 destructive words, the principal topics being loss, lack, failure, and sickness. I reply, no, I thank you. I've had enough old-fashioned chats in my life. They are too expensive, but I will be glad to have a new fashion chat and talk about what we want, not what we don't want. There is an old saying that man only dares use his words for three purposes, to heal, bless, or prosper. What man says of others will be said of him, and what he wishes for another, he is wishing for himself. Curses like chickens come home to roost. If a man wishes someone bad luck, he is sure to attract bad luck himself. If he wishes to aid someone to success, he is wishing and aiding himself to success. The body may be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease be completely wiped out of the consciousness. The metaphysician knows that all disease has a mental correspondence, and in order to heal the body, one must first heal the soul. The soul is the subconscious mind, and it must be saved from wrong thinking. In the 23rd Psalm, we read, He restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind or soul must be restored with the right ideas, and the mystical marriage is the marriage of the soul and the spirit, or the subconscious and superconscious mind. They must be one. When the subconscious is flooded with the perfect ideas of the superconscious, God and man are one. I and the Father are one. That is, he is one with the realm of perfect ideas. He is the man made in God's likeness and image, imagination, and has given power and dominion over all created things, his mind, body, and affairs. It is safe to say that all sickness and unhappiness come from the violation of the law of love. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another. And in the game of life, love or goodwill takes every trick. For example, a woman I know had for years an appearance of a terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable and she was in despair. She was on the stage and she feared she would soon have to give up her profession and she had no other means of support. She, however, procured a good engagement and on the opening night made a great hit. She received flattering notices from the critics and was joyful and elated. The next day, she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast had been jealous of her success and had caused her to be sent away. She felt hatred and resentment taking complete possession of her, and she cried out, Oh God, don't let me hate that man. That night, she worked for hours in the silence. She said, I soon came into a very deep silence. I seemed to be at peace with myself, with the man, and with the whole world. I continued this for two following nights, and on the third day, I found I was healed completely of the skin disease. In asking for love or goodwill, she had fulfilled the law. For love is the fulfilling of the law, and the disease which came from subconscious resentment was wiped out. Continual criticism produces rheumatism, as critical, inharmonious thoughts cause unnatural deposits in the blood, which settle in the joints. 
False growths are caused by jealousy, hatred, unforgiveness, fear, etc. Every disease is caused by a mind not at ease. I said once in my class, there is no use asking anyone, what's the matter with you? We might just as well say, who's the matter with you? Unforgiveness is the most prolific cause of disease. It will harden arteries or liver and affect the eyesight. In its train are endless ills. I called on a woman one day who said she was ill from having eaten a poisoned oyster. I replied, oh no, the oyster was harmless. You poisoned the oyster. What's the matter with you? She answered, oh, about 19 people. She had quarreled with 19 people and had become so inharmonious that she attracted the wrong oyster. Any inharmony on the external indicates there is mental inharmony. As the within, so the without. Man's only enemies are within himself, and man's foes shall be they of his own household. Personality is one of the last enemies to be overcome, as this planet is taking its initiation in love. It was Christ's message, peace on earth, good will towards man. The enlightened man, therefore, endeavors to perfect himself upon his neighbor. His work is with himself, to send out good will and blessings to every man. And the marvelous thing is that if one blesses a man, he has no power to harm him. For example, a man came to me asking to treat for success in business. He was selling machinery, and a rival appeared on the scene with what he proclaimed was a better machine, and my friend feared defeat. I said, first of all, we must wipe out all fear and know that God protects your interests and that the divine idea must come out of the situation. That is, the right machine will be sold by the right man to the right man. And I added, don't hold one critical thought towards that man. Bless him all day and be willing not to sell your machine if it isn't the divine idea. So he went to the meeting, fearless and non-resistant, and blessing the other man. He said the outcome was very remarkable. The other man's machine refused to work, and he sold his without the slightest difficulty. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you. Goodwill produces a great aura of protection about the one who sends it, and no weapon that is formed against him shall prosper. In other words, love and goodwill destroy the enemies within oneself. Therefore, one has no enemies on the external. There is peace on earth for him who sends goodwill to man. Chapter 4, The Law of Non-Resistance. Resist not evil, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sweep all before it. Jesus Christ said, resist not evil, for he knew in reality there is no evil, therefore nothing to resist. Evil has come of a man's vain imagination or a belief in two powers, good and evil. There is an old legend that Adam and Eve ate of Maya the tree of illusion and saw two powers instead of one power, God. Therefore, evil is a false law man has made for himself through psychoma or soul sleep. Soul sleep means that man's soul has been hypnotized by the race belief of sin, sickness, and death, etc., which is carnal or mortal thought, and his affairs have outpictured his illusions. We have read in a preceding chapter that man's soul is his subconscious mind, and whatever he feels deeply, good or bad, is outpictured by that faithful servant. His body and affairs show forth what he has been picturing. The sick man has pictured sickness, the poor man, poverty, the rich man, wealth. People often say, why does a little child attract illness when it is too young even to know what it means? I answer that children are sensitive and receptive to the thoughts of others about them, 
and often outpicture the fears of their parents. I heard a metaphysician once say, if you do not run your subconscious mind yourself, someone else will run it for you. Mothers often unconsciously attract illness and disaster to their children by continually holding them in thoughts of fear and watching for symptoms. For example, a friend asked a woman if her little girl had had the measles. She replied promptly, not yet. This implied that she was expecting the illness and therefore preparing the way for what she did not want for herself and child. However, the man who is centered and established in right thinking, the man who sends out only goodwill to his fellow man, and who is without fear, cannot be touched or influenced by the negative thoughts of others. In fact, he could then receive only good thoughts, as he himself sends forth only good thoughts. Resistance is hell, for it places man in a state of torment. A metaphysician once gave me a wonderful recipe for taking every trick in the game of life. It is the acme of non-resistance. He gave it in this way. At one time in my life, I baptized children, and of course, they had many names. Now I no longer baptize children, but I baptize events, but I give every event the same name. If I have a failure, I baptize it success in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In this, we see the great law of transmutation founded on non-resistance. Through his spoken word, every failure was transmuted into success. For example, a woman who required money and who knew the spiritual law of opulence was thrown continually in a business way with a man who made her feel very poor he talked lack and limitation, and she commenced to catch his poverty thoughts, so she disliked him and blamed him for her failure. She knew in order to demonstrate her supply, she must first feel that she had received. A feeling of opulence must precede its manifestation. It dawned upon her one day that she was resisting the situation and seeing two powers instead of one. So she blessed the man and baptized the situation success. She affirmed, as there is only one power, God, this man is here for my good and my prosperity. Just what he did not seem to be there for. Soon after that, she met through this man, a woman who gave her for a service rendered several thousand dollars. And the man moved to a distant city and faded harmoniously from her life. Make the statement, every man is a golden link in the chain of my good. For all men are God in manifestation, awaiting the opportunity given by man himself to serve the divine plan of his life. Bless your enemy, and you rob him of his ammunition. His arrows will be transmuted into blessings. This law is true of nations as well as individuals. Bless a nation, send love and goodwill to every inhabitant, and it is robbed of its power to harm. Man can only get the right idea of non-resistance through spiritual understanding. My students have often said, I don't want to be a doormat. I reply, when you use non-resistance with wisdom, no one will ever be able to walk over you. Another example. One day I was impatiently awaiting an important telephone call. I resisted every call that came in and made no outgoing calls myself, reasoning that it might interfere with the one I was awaiting. Instead of saying, divine ideas never conflict, the call will come at the right time, leaving it to infinite intelligence to arrange, I commenced to manage things myself. I made the battle mine, not God's, and remained tense and anxious. The bell did not ring for about an hour, and I glanced at the phone and found the receiver had been off that length of time, and the phone was disconnected. My anxiety, fear, and belief in interference had brought on a total eclipse of the telephone. Realizing what I had done, I commenced blessing the situation at once. I baptized its success and affirmed, I cannot lose any call that belongs to me by divine right. I am under grace and not under law. A friend rushed out to the nearest telephone to notify the company to reconnect. She entered a crowded grocery, but the proprietor left his customers and attended to the call himself. 
my phone was connected at once. And two minutes later, I received a very important call. And about an hour afterward, the one I had been awaiting. One's ships come in over a calm sea. So long as man resists the situation, he will have it with him. If he runs away from it, it will run after him. For example, I repeated this to a woman one day, and she replied, how true that is. I was unhappy at home. I disliked my mother, who was critical and domineering. So I ran away and was married. But I married my mother, for my husband was exactly like my mother, and I had the same situation to face again. Agree with thine adversary quickly. That means agree that the adverse situation is good. Be undisturbed by it, and it falls away of its own weight. None of these things move me is a wonderful affirmation. The inharmonious situation comes from some inharmony within man himself. When there is in him no emotional response to an inharmonious situation, it fades away forever from his pathway. So we see man's work is ever with himself. People have said to me, give treatments to change my husband or my brother. I reply, no, I will give treatments to change you. When you change, your husband and your brother will change. One of my students was in the habit of lying. I told her it was a failure method, and if she lied, she would be lied too. She replied, I don't care. I can't possibly get along without lying. One day, she was speaking on the phone to a man with whom she was very much in love. She turned to me and said, I don't trust him. I know he's lying to me. I replied, well, you lie yourself, so someone has to lie to you, and you will be sure it will be just the person you want the truth from. Some time after that, I saw her, and she said, I'm cured of lying. I questioned, what cured you? She replied, I have been living with a woman who lied worse than I did. One is often cured of his faults by seeing them in others. Life is a mirror, and we find only ourselves reflected in our associates. Living in the past is a failure method and a violation of spiritual law. Jesus Christ said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Lot's wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. The robbers of time are the past and the future. Man should bless the past and forget it if it keeps him in bondage, and bless the future knowing it has in store for him endless joys, but live fully in the now. For example, a woman came to me complaining that she had no money with which to buy Christmas gifts. She said, last year was so different. I had plenty of money and gave lovely presents, and this year I have scarcely a cent. I replied, you will never demonstrate money while you are pathetic and live in the past. Live fully in the now and get ready to give Christmas presents. Dig your ditches and the money will come. She exclaimed, I know what to do. I will buy some tinsel twine, Christmas seals, and wrapping paper. I replied, do that, and the presents will come and stick themselves to the Christmas seals. This, too, was showing financial fearlessness and faith in God, as the reasoning mind said, keep every cent you have, as you are not sure you will get any more. She bought the seals, paper, and twine, and a few days before Christmas, received a gift of several hundred dollars Buying the seals and twine had impressed the subconscious with expectancy and opened the way for the manifestation of the money. She purchased all the presents in plenty of time. Man must live suspended in the moment. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dog. He must be spiritually alert, ever awaiting his leads, taking advantage of every opportunity. One day, I said continually, silently, Infinite Spirit, don't let me miss a trip. And something very important was told to me that evening. It is most necessary to begin the day with right words. Make an affirmation immediately upon waking. For example, Thy will be done this day. Today is a day of completion. I give thanks for this perfect day. Miracle shall follow miracle and wonders shall never cease. Make this a habit, and one will see wonders and miracles come into life. One morning, 
I picked up a book and read, Look with wonder at that which is before you. It seemed to be my message for the day, so I repeated it again and again, Look with wonder at that which is before you. At about noon, a large sum of money was given me, which I had been desiring for a certain purpose. In a following chapter, I will give affirmations that I have found most effective. However, one should never use an affirmation unless it is absolutely satisfying and convincing to his own consciousness. And often, an affirmative is changed to suit different people. For example, the following has brought success to many. I have a wonderful work in a wonderful way. I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. I gave the first two lines to one of my students, and she added the last two. It made a most powerful statement, as there should always be perfect payment for perfect service, and a rhyme sinks easily into the subconscious. She went about singing it aloud, and soon did receive wonderful work in a wonderful way, and gave wonderful service for wonderful pay. Another student, a businessman, took it and changed the word work to business. He repeated, I have a wonderful business in a wonderful way, and I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. That afternoon, he made a $41,000 deal, though there had been no activity in his affairs for months. Every affirmation must be carefully worded and completely cover the ground. For example, I knew a woman who was in great need and made a demand for work. She received a great deal of work, but was never paid anything. She now knows to add wonderful service for wonderful pay. It is man's divine right to have plenty, more than enough. His barns should be full and his cup should flow over. This is God's idea for man. And when man breaks down the barriers of lack in his own consciousness, the golden age will be his, and every righteous desire of his heart fulfilled. Chapter 5, The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness Man receives only that which he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words return to him sooner or later with astounding accuracy. This is the law of karma, which is Sanskrit for comeback. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For example, a friend told me this story of herself, illustrating the law. She said, I make all my karma on my aunt. Whatever I say to her, someone says to me. I am often irritable at home, and one day said to my aunt, who was talking to me during dinner, no more talk, I wish to eat in peace. The following day, I was lunching with a woman with whom I wished to make a great impression. I was talking animatedly when she said, no more talk, I wish to eat in peace. My friend is high in consciousness, so her karma returns much more quickly than to one on the mental plane. The more man knows, the more he is responsible for, and a person with a knowledge of spiritual law, which he does not practice, suffers greatly in consequence. The fear of the Lord, law, is the beginning of wisdom. If we read the word Lord, law, it will make many passages in the Bible much clearer. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, law. It is the law which takes vengeance, not God. God sees man perfect, created in his own image, imagination, and given power and dominion. This is the perfect idea of man registered in divine mind, awaiting man's recognition. For man can only be what he sees himself to be, and only attain what he sees himself attaining. Nothing ever happens without an onlooker, is an ancient saying. Man sees first his failure or success, his joy or sorrow, before it swings into visibility from the scenes set in his own imagination. We have observed this in the mother picturing disease for her child, or a woman seeing success for her husband. Jesus Christ said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we see freedom from all unhappy conditions comes through knowledge, a knowledge of spiritual law. Obedience precedes authority, 
and the law obeys man when he obeys the law. The law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes man's servant. When handled ignorantly, it becomes man's deadly foe. So with the laws of mind. For example, a woman with a strong personal will wished she owned a house which belonged to an acquaintance, and she often made mental pictures of herself living in the house. In the course of time, the man died, and she moved into the house. Several years afterwards, coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she said to me, Do you think I had anything to do with that man's death? I replied, Yes, your desire was so strong, everything made way for it. But you paid your karmic debt. Your husband, whom you loved devotedly, died soon after, and the house was a white elephant on your hands for years. The original owner, however, could not have been affected by her thoughts had he been positive in the truth, nor her husband, but they were both under karmic law. The woman should have said, feeling the great desire for the house, infinite intelligence, give me the right house, equally as charming as this, the house which is mine by divine right. The divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all. The divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work by. Desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. In demonstrating, the most important step is the first step to ask a right. Man should always demand only that which is his by divine right. To go back to the illustration, had the woman taken this attitude, if this house I desire is mine, I cannot lose it. If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man might have decided to move out harmoniously, had it been the divine selection for her, or another house would have been substituted. Anything forced into manifestation through personal will is always ill-got and has ever bad success. Man is admonished, my will be done, not thine. And the curious thing is, man always gets just what he desires when he does relinquish personal will, thereby enabling infinite intelligence to work through him. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord, law. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. Her daughter had determined to take a very hazardous trip and the mother was filled with fear. She said she had used every argument, had pointed out the dangers to be encountered and forbidden her to go. But the daughter became more and more rebellious and determined. I said to the mother, you are forcing your personal will upon your daughter, which you have no right to do. And your fear of the trip is only attracting it for man attracts what he fears. I added, let go and take your mental hands off. Put it in God's hands and use this statement. I put this situation in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist. But if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks that it is now dissolved and dissipated. A day or two after that, her daughter said to her, Mother, I have given up the trip, and the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to stand still, which seems so difficult for man. I will deal more fully with this law in the chapter on non-resistance. I will give another example of sowing and reaping, which came in the most curious way. A woman came to me saying she had received a counterfeit $20 bill given to her at the bank. She was much disturbed, for she said the people at the bank will never acknowledge their mistake. I replied, let's analyze the situation and find out why you attracted it. She thought a few moments and exclaimed, I know it. I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So the law had sent her some stage money for it doesn't know anything about jokes. I said, now we will call on the law of forgiveness and neutralize the situation. Christianity is founded upon the law of forgiveness. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the karmic law, and the Christ within each man is his redeemer and salvation from all inharmonious conditions. So I said, infinite spirit, we call on the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law, and cannot lose this $20, which is hers by divine right. Now I said, go back to the bank and tell them fearlessly that it was given you there by mistake. 
She obeyed, and to her surprise, they apologized and gave her another bill, treating her most courteously. So knowledge of the law gives man power to rub out his mistakes. Man cannot force the external to be what he is not. If he desires riches, he must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, if you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All men with great wealth are orderly and order is heaven's first law. I added, you will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor and commenced immediately putting her house in order. She rearranged furniture, straightened out bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. The woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity, knowing God is her supply. Many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably leads to loss. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. For example, I knew a man who wanted to buy a fur-lined overcoat. He and his wife went to various shops, but there was none he wanted. He said they were all too cheap looking. At last he was shown one, the salesman said was valued at $1,000, but which the manager would sell him for $500 as it was late in the season. His financial possessions amounted to about $700. The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend nearly all you have on a coat. But he was very intuitive and never reasoned. He turned to his wife and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a ton of money. So his wife consented weakly. About a month later, he received a $10,000 commission. The coat made him feel so rich. It linked him with success and prosperity. Without the coat, he would not have received the commission. It was an investment paying large dividends. If man ignores these leadings to spend or to give, the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me on Thanksgiving Day she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money, but decided to save it. A few days later, someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost. The law always stands back of the man who spends fearlessly with wisdom. For example, one of my students was shopping with her little nephew. The child clamored for a toy, which she told him she could not afford to buy. She realized suddenly that she was seeking lack and not recognizing God as her supply. So she bought the toy and on her way home, picked up in the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it. Man's supply is inexhaustible and unfailing when fully trusted, but faith or trust must precede the demonstration. According to your faith, be it unto you.